What is going on world? What's up YouTube? It's Zero here. Today I'm bringing you guys a brand new episode of the 8 Below Show. Welcome everyone to 8 Below. Thanks for being here guys to the best entertainment related show here on YouTube. And I'm super excited about our episode here today. We have a lot of stuff to talk about, so let's get into it. In this first segment of the show, we're going to be talking about Alien, guys, and this franchise as a whole, kind of where we are so far, but also the talks of an Alien prequel that are going to be coming out, and I'm really, really excited about hearing about a prequel to Alien, more origins on how this story, you know, and legacy, the lore continues to build over time. Ridley Scott has built something really special. Now, obviously, there's been some hits and some misses in the Alien franchise. I want to talk about everything that we know, though, so far about the Alien prequel. We can break it down, and I would love to hear your thoughts in the comment section down below. So let's get into it. So, guys, in an article that was written by Chris Evangelista, of Slash Film, Will There Be a Sequel to Alien Covenant? In 2012, Ridley Scott returned to the world of Alien with the prequel movie Prometheus. In 2017, the story continued with Alien Covenant. Scott said in multiple interviews that he planned to keep the story going, but so far that hasn't happened. In the time since Scott started this new prequel series, 20th Century Fox owners of Alien was engulfed by Disney. That means the acid-bleeding uh, xenomorphs are now the property of the House of Mouse, which I think we can all agree is a little weird. As of the writing of this story, Disney is developing an Alien TV series with Noah Hawley for FX on Hulu. So, let's talk about kind of like where we are, guys. So, with Alien, obviously, the most recent addition, continuation of that franchise was Alien Covenant. And yes, guys, I think it was certainly a step in the right direction from what we got, of course, in the form of Prometheus. I thought that Prometheus, guys, was a massive misfire. I thought that it had a lot of potential. And that's the thing with Ridley Scott. He's one of my favorite directors, guys. I absolutely love this guy as a director. But like most directors out there, guys, they're gonna you're going to have hits and you're also going to have misses. And Prometheus, the idea was Ridley Scott wanted to really build, continue building the legacy, the lore, the story of Alien in the form of Prometheus. Ridley Scott has actually publicly stated that he always wanted Alien to be like the next Star Wars. We know that it's obviously not the next Star Wars, guys, but that was kind of his version of Star Wars was in the form of Alien and Prometheus and this prequel film, um, whenever that may come out. Now, even though Prometheus was, in my opinion, a massive misfire, I stu still think that there were definitely people that enjoyed it but Alien Covenant, to me, was definitely a step in the right direction, and it kind of gives us a path forward, which I'm, which I'm really, really excited about. So, Ridley Scott's Alien is an immortal classic, a scary, brilliantly crafted blend of sci-fi and horror that remains just as effective today as it was back in 1979. But Scott stepped away from the franchise following that first film, with other directors, including James Cameron, stepping in for a host of sequels. This might sound like a controversial opinion, but I am the mind of all of the Alien sequels have their charms. Are their movies as good as the? Um, are these movies as good as the first Alien? No, but they all bring something fun to the table. Be it the bleakness of David Fincher's Alien Three or the unapologetic weirdness of Jean Pierre Genut's Alien Resurrection. The Alien vs Predator movies are a different story, but let's go ahead and pretend they don't exist. So, obviously guys, for me, um, after Ridley Scott did Alien, wasn't a huge fan, uh, even though James Cameron's Alien was, was good, um, wasn't as good as the first one. I feel like we haven't had since the first Alien, a movie that's been, you know, as good as that very first one. Alien Covenant certainly was kind of, uh, for me, with the updated graphics of, you know, and the CGI being used and um, all of that, the cinematography of Alien Covenant I thought was great, but it still wasn't quite there to what the first Alien really meant, at least to me. Um, but I think that we're moving in the right direction. The end result was Prometheus, a film that opened in 2012. While there are plenty of elements that connect Prometheus to the first Alien movie, it's also a much different film. Where Alien leans into horror, Prometheus is more concerned with existential questions involving humanity's search for a higher power. The characters here aren't chasing after aliens, they're looking for gods. Reaction to Prometheus was a bit mixed, with many criticizing some of the dumb decisions some characters make, um... 
which I do agree. Um, there were, you know, some decisions, guys, that I didn't really like. And I didn't like that Prometheus, even though I, I respect the decision to go in a different direction where, you know, obviously you kind of, you move away from horror, but it's almost like, I'll give you an example. A horror game I absolutely love, guys, or horror series of games I really enjoy is Dead Space. Well, the first two Dead Space games were horror over action. And so you would, uh, in those titles, there was a lot of, you know, the horror elements were were so high. And that was so awesome. It was based around a horror title that had action elements to it. I feel the same way with the Alien movies. Alien, to a certain point, was, you know, had a lot of horror and then had those action elements to it. Well, Prometheus kind of flipped that around where they kind of wanted to have action over horror, have a little bit of some horror, but way more action. And it kind of felt that way like with Dead Space because the first two Dead Space games were that, but then it switched over in Dead Space 3 from being a horror title with action elements to an action title with horror elements. And I feel that's where there was like a big misfire there with Prometheus. Now, while the reaction to the film may have been mixed, the film itself was a big hit, hauling in $403 million on a $120 to $130 million budget. And those are the types of numbers that makes Hollywood want a sequel. As luck would have it, really, Scott was prepared, prepared for this. In an interview in 2015, Scott revealed he wasn't just planning one sequel to Prometheus. He was planning as many as three sequels. So, absolutely crazy, man. He wanted to have like a trilogy to Prometheus. Now, are we going to get a Prometheus continuation in the form of an alien prequel? That is really where we we, where we start kind of talking about, um, you know, because maybe he kind of learned some from some of the mistakes he made from Prometheus. He kind of learned what he did right, what he did wrong, and what he can do better in a Prometheus 2. So could the Alien prequel actually be a Prometheus 2? That is definitely something that is, of course, of consideration. Now, it released in 2017, Alien Covenant, Covenant was much more of an alien movie than Prometheus, as you can probably guess from the title. But while Scott used more alien iconography here, Going so far as to introduce Xenomorphs, Covenant is not an alien rehash. Like Prometheus, it's a much different experience. It's a dark, cynical experience that seems to suggest Scott has had enough of humanity and he's fine with us being wiped out. The end result was a moody, gothic film that was somehow even more polarizing than Prometheus. Lots of folks were unhappy that this wasn't just another alien movie with all the familiar trappings, but others were happy to see Scott go in this new direction. And I agree. I, I'm one, guys, that I like the new direction. Sure, it did not like I said, give me that the the feel of wow, this is this is gonna you know kind of uh, definitely compete against the original Alien as one of the best in the franchise. But I still thought the Alien Covenant was a step in the right direction from Prometheus. So really, guys, if they made a Prometheus two and they decided to do that, I think I would feel a little bit more comfortable with it now, knowing that we had Alien Covenant. Prometheus, obviously Ridley Scott probably realizes the things that he did wrong in the first Prometheus, how he can make it better in this one. Obviously, having the alien title in front of the movie is going to draw a certain crowd. And Prometheus 2, a lot of people may have a sour taste in their mouth after the first one. But I do think I would be completely open with either one at this point in time because we got uh, Alien Covenant. I felt that one movie can take you in the wrong direction in a franchise, that being like Prometheus. But one movie can bring you right back to where you should be going, that being in the form of Alien Covenant. So... What's the future here, guys? Well, with all that darkness in mind, I suppose it's not a huge surprise that Alien Covenant underperformed at the box office. Its total global intake was $240 million against a production budget of approximately $100 million. And that doesn't even figure in marketing costs. It was not what the studio wanted to see, and it cast the future of the franchise in doubt. So the future. A few days before Alien Covenant opened in theaters, really, Scott was already talking about the next film. The director said that if Covenant did well at the box office, he, he would start shooting the next film in 14 months, but that didn't happen. During this time, there was some talk about Neil Bl Blumkamp making his own Alien movie, a film that would ignore most of the sequels and serve as a direct follow-up to Aliens, but Blomkamp's film never got off the ground, and by all accounts, it's completely dead now. But what of Ridley Scott and his potential movies? In December of 2017, even after the low box office returns of Covenant were in, Scott was still talking about making more movies, saying, 
We are going to make another. We are. I think what we have to do is gradually drift away from the alien stuff. People say you need more alien, you need more face pulling, need more chest bursting. So I put a lot of that in Covenant and it fit in nicely. But I think if you go again, you need to start finding another solution that's more interesting. I think AI is becoming much more dangerous and therefore more interesting. In 2018, that talk continued. Scott said that if the film got made, it would return to the planet LV-426, which is where the characters in the first Alien ran afoul of those alien eggs and the facehuggers within. John Logan, who wrote Co Covenant, was on board to write the script for this new movie, which would be called Alien Awakening, but the project continued to stall. And then in 2020, Scott was still beating the drum, saying, what I always thought when I was making the first one was, why would a creature like this be made and why was it traveling in what I always thought was a kind of Warcraft, which was carrying a cargo of those uh, of these eggs? What was the purpose of the vehicle and what was the purpose of the eggs? That's the thing to question. Who, why, and for what purpose is the idea, I think. Uh, since then, we've heard very little regarding another really Scott Alien movie. Scott clearly shows no signs of slowing down. He has two movies due out obviously guys the house of gucci last duels already out he also carries a considerable amount of clout in the business could that be enough to convince disney to throw some money his way for at least one more alien movie so look guys at the end of the day the way i look at it is according to ridley scott's official imdb page it shows he's got a number of movies you know that have been uh, announced uh, Gladiator 2, which I think would be absolutely awesome, but an untitled Alien prequel is on there. And so, do I think that this is something that could be made? I believe that if there is going to be another Alien prequel, I don't believe it would be called Alien. I actually think it would be Prometheus 2. It would actually be a continuation of that because from the numbers, Prometheus did really, really well at the box office. Alien Covenant did not do as well, even though I thought Alien Covenant was a step in the right direction. So could Prometheus 2 be the next up-and-coming addition to this franchise? I believe that would be the, you know, probably what's most likely to happen, but it really comes down to Disney. Does Disney want to take a risk on this, um, and, you know, continuing this, especially seeing the numbers? But let me know, guys, what do you all think in the comment section down below? I'd love to hear what you all think about an Alien prequel, a Prometheus 2. What would you guys want to see? Let me know. And for more Alien content and videos, stay here with Zero TV. So with Dune Part 1 out, I thought it would be really good for us to talk about the future of this of this franchise, of what the possibilities could be in a Dune 2. Obviously, Dune Part 1 has been one of those titles, guys, that people, lots of people are absolutely loving. They're, you know, the scope of it, all of those different things, feeling like a Lord of the Rings and a and obviously a Star Wars film kind of built in uh, to both of those things. And I wanted to talk about Dune Part 2 and everything that we know so far about this title, what it could be, and I would love to hear you guys' thoughts in the comment section down below. So let's get into it. So guys, in an article written by Thomas Lethbridge, of Screen Rant, Denny Villeneuve's new Dune film only tells half the story from the original novel, emphasizing the need for there to be a Dune Part 2. Now guys, warning, this is going to contain spoilers from the Dune book, so uh, you know, you've know you been warned if you haven't seen the original Dune uh, Part 1, or if you have not read the books. Despite its extended runtime and in-depth world building, Denny Villeneuve's Dune only tells half the story of Frank Herbert's original novel. Although the creative decision to split the story in half may frustrate some fans, it does emphasize the need for a follow-up. While Dune Part 2 is yet to be greenlit, the positive reception to the new movie means that a concluding chapter is looking increasingly likely. The Dune story focuses on Paul Atreides, the teenage son of Duke Leto, who travels to the desert planet Arrakis with his father. Arrakis, also known as Dune, is a desert planet and the only known center for the production of spice, a mystical substance that can both heighten awareness and fuel interstellar travel. Although the Atreides head to Arrakis to reform spice production and increase prosperity, it soon becomes clear that they have walked into a trap laid by the P uh, Pandish uh, Emperor and their mortal enemies. Paul is forced to flee with his mother, the Lady Jessica, before mustering a rebellious fighting force from the local people, the Freemen. So, okay, let us let me give you guys kind of a little bit of 
for me personally, after watching the first Dune film, and uh, I finished it recently, and Dune Part 1, guys, a couple of things here. Uh, number one, do I think it's as good as a lot of other people are saying it is? I do not. I think Dune what, Part 1 was pretty awesome from a visual perspective, cinematography. Um, I thought the acting was great as well. Um, just a lot of those camera shots were just so well done. I felt, though, that there was a significant lull in the movie. I thought that they could have you know, really shortened the length of the movie at certain points through time. Um, I felt that it kind of dragged on, especially near the end. And obviously the uh, the sandworms or whatever those worms were called, those were really awesome. And I'm glad that that was a part of, uh, of the story. I just wish that there was more than just, it felt like so much of the time it was kind of more so about them. And then obviously the emperor was obviously a pretty sinister, um, you know, uh, personality in, in Dune Part 1. But I just wanted there to be more, like more creatures, more, uh, just more in general, in my opinion, that's what I kind of wanted. You know, a lot of people are pointing to Star Wars as a comparison to Dune, but in Star Wars, you've got all kinds of different you know, creatures and, and planets and things of that nature. And I feel like Dune could have done a really good job of kind of introducing more uh, to it. It kind of builds that legacy, the lore, the story, I feel, when you're kind of showing a little bit more some of the more, you know, other sinister, you know, baddies, I guess you could say, in this universe outside of just the sandworms and such. I just would have liked to see a little bit more uh, than what was given. Um, and like I said, it did kind of lull for me uh, slightly. But that doesn't get away from what I thought of like from a visual perspective the scope of it is incredible I thought that the acting was brilliant um, and, and Zendaya I really wanted to see more of her character in this story you know she doesn't really come in until the end of the movie and that I thought was uh, unfortunate because I really wanted to see and learn more about her now maybe we're going to learn more about her in part 2 but I'm judging it based on part 1 being just its own thing so we'll have to kind of wait and see now the novel itself concludes with the destruction of House Harkonnen and the installation of Paul, now known by his followers as Maudib, as the next emperor. However, Villeneuve's new movie finishes long before these events and instead focuses on setting up the narrative and establishing the world of Dune. As a result, there is still much of the story left to be told in the fu a future concluding film. So why Dune is, is split into two parts? Although Frank Herbert's original 412-page novel is by no means the longest book to receive a theatrical adaptation, the universe it established is incredibly complex. In addition to the futuristic setting, the story incorporates elements of a mysticism, a philosophy, uh, extrasensory perception, religion, genetics, and technology. This means that any adaptation has to first indulge in extensive world building in order to create something believable. By splitting the film into two parts, Villeneuve has given himself the best opportunity to deliver a faithful recrea uh, recreation that does justice to Herbert's hall uh, hallowed source material. This could also represent a lesson learned from David Lynch's uh, Pan 1984 version, which is planned to do it all in just two hours and surpri unsurprisingly fell short. So, okay, I I would say this, guys. Denny Villeneuve is one of the best directors in the world, and it's not even close. I mean, he has done an incredible job. I thought Arrival was my favorite movie by him. Um, I thought that was number one. I thought Sicario was very good as well, but Arrival, for sure, to me, was his best movie he's made. Um, and better than Dune. I, I, I lo Like I said, I like Dune for what it is. I thought that he did a really good job of the cinematography and just kind of putting a lot of these pieces together to kind of start at least introducing and building th this story from, from the very, you know, foundation. Um, I just thought that this kind of fell short in certain areas, um, unfortunately. And that's just for me. That's just my opinion. I would love to hear your guys' thoughts about it in the comment section down below. But that get, does not take away from Denny Villeneuve being a fantastic director. So would I, would I like him to do part two? Absolutely. Now, several key characters uh, would have to return for Dune part two to be a success. Not only would Timothy Chimelet's Paul Atreides need to feature prominently, but figures such as Javier Bardem's Stigler, uh, Zendaya's uh, Shani, and Rebecca Ferguson's Lady Jessica will also need to play significant parts. However, should the film follow the book, book several characters would not make return appearances. Oscar Isaac's Duke Leto, for instance, would not appear unless in flashback form after his death at the hands of the Harkonnens, nor would David um, Peter DeVries or Jason Momoa's Duncan Idaho after their own respective demises. So, 
Here we go, guys. What happens in the book here? Well, the new movie covers roughly half of the original novel up until Paul's meeting with the Freeman tribe led by Stigler. This means that Doom Part 2, should it actually happen, will be an action-packed blockbuster focused on the guerrilla war between Paul's Freeman and Arrakis' uh, Harkonnen oppressors. After a two-year conflict, Paul will eventually emerge victorious and even successfully dispose, uh, depose the Emperor after he attempts to bring Arrakis to heel with the presence of his elite uh, Sadarkar Storm. Stormtroopers. This sets the stage for the wider Dune saga and the ascension of House Atreides. Now, here's what I got to say about this, guys. Um, you know, making a second Dune movie, I think is awesome because, you know, separating it into two films, I think was actually pretty smart because there's just so much to unpack there. I didn't read the original book, but knowing that a lot of movies that are being, you know, uh, obviously books that are be being adapted into movies, this is starting to become more commonplace, but... What I will say about it is, guys, is that I think that there's an opportunity that if they were to make a sequel to Dune Part 1, make Part 2, I would not be surprised whatsoever if they started doing spinoffs and prequels and things of that nature to Dune um, because there's a good chance that a lot of people are saying that this could be like the next Star Wars, and if that's the case, they would definitely milk this for all that it's worth. Um, now, there's been a lot of talk, guys, that... Denny Villeneuve would not make a sequel to Dune Part 1 because of what happened with HBO Max um, having, you know, obviously the movie Dune Part 1 go on to HBO Max same time it goes to theaters and a lot of people don't like that. I'm okay with it but because um, I believe it's just kind of the way of the future but you know, a lot of people did not like that. They wanted it to be, you know, to go to theaters first and then go to HBO Max. Um, nonetheless, though, um, Denny Villeneuve was not happy with Warner Brothers uh, for, you know, for doing that, to say the least. Now, as far as the release date goes, guys, and this is all purely speculation, although there's been no official confirmation of the sequel, plans for expanding the Dune series are already underway. Not only has screenwriter Eric Roth confirmed that a full treatment for Dune Part 2 has already been written, but director Denny Villeneuve revealed in an interview with Total Film that he is optimistic that the project will go ahead. As he explained it, it would need a really bad outcome at the box office to not have a Dune Part 2 because the studio loved the movie. They are proud of the movie, so they want the movie to move forward, and they still did half of it, so, you know, I'm very optimistic. This means that if filming starts in 2022, there's a chance a follow-up could hit cinemas in 2023. So... That's uh that that's pretty optimistic. I would say it may be a little bit later than that, guys. Denny Villeneuve, I'm sure, is going to be working on other projects. It may take a little bit for them to have those contract negotiations to make sure that, hey, Dune Part 2, we want that to go to theaters first and then go to HBO Max or some uh, somewhere else. Um, that being said, we'll have to kind of wait and see, guys. I'll be sure to give you guys more information as it comes out. But I'd love to hear your thoughts. Should they make a Dune Part 2? Um, I think the answer is obvious, but... You know, who should be the director? Should they, you know, be creating other prequel movies outside of Dune? What do you guys think should happen here? Let me know in the comment section down below. And for more Dune content and videos, stay here with Zero TV. So you guys know, if you've been following my YouTube channel, you know that I absolutely love horror movies, horror movies, horror games, and obviously, guys, with when it comes to the October season and the Halloween season as a whole, I love watching horror movies, and Antlers, guys, is the newest one that I got a chance to, to take in. This is an uh, obviously a supernatural horror film directed by Scott Cooper. It was produced by none other than Guillermo del Toro, and look, guys, I just want to jump into this. You know it when I do movie reviews. I kind of just kind of ramble about a, a movie in particular. Don't necessarily go over all the significant plot points or anything of that nature. I tell you what I thought about it and what I got to say about Antlers, guys. It's a good time. As a horror movie, I thought that it was a fantastic time, really. Um, I think this is definitely a movie that you're going to want to see in theaters. And uh, this story, just so you know, follows a school teacher and her police officer brother in a small Oregon town where they become become convinced one of her students is harboring a supernatural creature. And so very, uh, you know, when I heard that initial synopsis of Antlers, I was really intrigued. I was like, wow, this might be something pretty special. Then you see the trailers and the trailers guys are, are great. They're pretty unnerving in a number of, you know, different areas. 
So I went into this with pretty high expectation because Antlers was a movie that I've been wanting to see for a while, but it had a number of delays due to obviously the pandemic, which so many movies obviously got affected by that. And so it been, had been delayed a number of times. And so this was one of those movies I'd been looking forward to. I'm so glad that, you know, coming out, you know, right around Halloween, absolutely awesome. That being said though, guys, um, you know, I would say that this is definitely a movie. If you're a big horror fan, this is a movie certainly worth experiencing in the theater, checking out. You want to, you know, if you want to be scared, you know, around Halloween, absolutely check out this movie. And from the critical response from other people out there as well, guys, it's been pretty good over pretty positive. When I think of horror movies, most of the time, horror movies don't get great reviews on Rotten Tomatoes and places of that nature sure just because it's a horror movie, you know, and a lot of times they don't get as good of ratings. I think a lot of times like The Conjuring got pretty good ratings. This is one of those movies, guys, that got good ratings overall, generally favorable reviews based on Rotten Tomatoes and places of that nature. Now, we'll have to wait and see as time goes what that, you know, review aggregator is going to be as time goes on. But for me, guys, I thought it was a great time. It's a great Halloween movie. I would recommend it. The scare are good. I thought the acting was fantastic by the boy. I thought it was fantastic by pretty much everybody involved. I thought the acting was good. I thought the cinematography was good and the scares were great. Um, and overall guys, I'd have to give this a pretty, you know, my stamp of approval. I would suggest checking it out. If you're planning on seeing some horror, a uh, horror movie in the Halloween season, this should be near the top of the list. But let me know, guys, have you seen Antlers? What did you think about it? Let me know in the comment section down below. And for more Antlers content and videos, stay here with Zero TV. With the release of Far Cry 6, and obviously the pretty positive reception Far Cry 6 got, guys, and I myself really enjoyed the title as well, I wanted to talk about the future of this franchise. On this channel, guys, you know we talk about the future of games, the future of movies, entertainment as a whole, and so... What better than to talk about Far Cry 7? It's a very, very early to talk about Far Cry 7, but it's never too early to look at the future of a franchise, especially when you had an entry like Far Cry 6, which I thought was fantastic. Far Cry 5 was fantastic. And so that being said, I wanted to go ahead and talk about Everything that we know about Far Cry 7 at this point in time. And I would love to hear you guys' thoughts in the comment section down below about your thoughts about Far Cry 6 and where you think the series is headed. So let's talk about it. In an article, guys, written by Ollie Jones of Games Radar, Far Cry 6 will reportedly be online-oriented as part of a series shakeup. Far Cry 7 will reportedly, reportedly have an online-oriented approach as Ubisoft looks to reinvent the series. In the latest Axios Gaming newsletter, uh, reporter uh, Steven Totillo suggests that while Far Cry 6 might perform well, developer Ubisoft appears to know a shakeup is needed. Totillo states that his sources claim the company was exploring a more online-oriented approach for a sequel. While neither to, uh, Totilo nor Schreier revealed much about the new direction that the series could go in, it's certainly possible that Ubisoft is looking to reinvent Far Cry. The series hasn't changed much, much since Far Cry 3 in 2012, even with theme spinoffs like Primal and Blood Dragon. In that same period, however, Ubisoft rebooted the entire Assassin's Creed franchise, starting with 2017's Origins, but to Totilo points out that other franchises like Watch Dogs and Ghost Recon have yet to receive similar overhauls. So let's talk about this. Let's just say, for example, there's an online emphasis more so on Far Cry 7. I actually am open to it, guys. The problem, though, to me, though, is when we look at movie uh, uh, games like Assassin's Creed, I feel that Assassin's Creed lost its way. I really do. Now, Assassin's Creed Valhalla, I really enjoyed overall. I thought it was fantastic. It was the best Assassin's Creed I've played in years. However, I feel like the online approach with Assassin's Creed was something that, you know, it, it felt a little bit forced and I felt that it kind of gave us games like Origins and Odyssey, which I did not like whatsoever. And it just has felt like it kind of went in the stagnant state. Now, sure, Valhalla, obviously I felt was a great step in the right direction for Assassin's Creed. And that's what it is, guys. Sometimes there's a couple of games or a game that takes you in the wrong direction with the franchise. And all it takes is one game to bring you right back up to where you need to be going. So with Far Cry... Could they 
uh, afford to make a mistake here with Far Cry 7, making it online oriented. I think they can. I, I think that they've built something pretty special. The only thing for me, though, guys, is from Far Cry 5 to Far Cry 6, it's incredible that those two, from the iconic villains to just everything that they were doing with those two games in particular, I feel like why stop when it's when you're going in such a great direction, creating these awesome characters and great villains and such, and the landscapes and just everything is just so becoming more and more like uh, more of a legacy for Far Cry as a whole. And I just don't want them to see. I, I don't want to see them stop doing that where they're just going to be online oriented. I think being online oriented. And it is important, guys. Don't get me wrong. We talk about a full package all the time. Having a single-player story, co-op modes, and multiplayer. Having a full package is so important with these games. But having more of an emphasis on online, I don't know if that means, like something more positive for the franchise. Now, if they went in the direction like a Call of Duty, where it's way more of a PvP type of style, and they have multiple maps, and they create an esports scene, and all of those things, maybe that would be a good investment for Far Cry, because I always felt that it had the possibility for that. But other than that, I just don't know um, if going fully more online oriented, oriented is going to start diminishing the story of Far Cry, and that's what I really don't want to have happen. In recent months, the company has been uh, seen a significant leadership overhaul, which could bring major changes to one of its oldest series. After the departure of former chief creative director Serge Hasquet, and a number of other executives amid reports of workplace abuse, veteran Ubisoft developer Igor Mansu was promoted into the role last month. Games Radar Far Cry 6 review said that the game delivers more explosive action and adventure than ever before, but noted that it fumbles some of its more upsetting plot points. According to Metacritic, the game's review score sits between 75 and 80, down a decent way on the mid to high 80s that previous entries have garnered. With some reviewers, the game doesn't do enough to push the series forward. Forward. And I disagree with that. I think it did do enough to push the series forward. I just think that, um, you know, they, they, they are going to need to make some changes, guys, from one game to the next. I just don't know if it's going to be fully online oriented that, you know, making it online only or whatever the case may be that they're thinking about doing. It will be interesting to see nonetheless. But I thought from Far Cry 5, Far Cry 6, I mean, they're moving in a great direction. I was not a fan of Primal, was not a fan of New Dawn, um, but these main entries have been something pretty special as of late, at least in my opinion. But I'd love to hear your guys' thoughts. Where do you think the direction should be for Far Cry 7? Should it be more online oriented? Should they continue what is working for them as far as creating great characters, great villains, and things of that nature? What do you all think? Let me know in the comment section down below. And for more Far Cry 7 content and videos, stay here with Zero TV. One of my favorite movies of all time is Gladiator. What an iconic movie, guys, by a great director, great actor. I just thought it was absolutely phenomenal. And with the talk of a Gladiator 2 coming out, I got so excited and I am really excited to talk about this, guys, because Gladiator 2 has been something that's been in the talks for a long time and it sounds like we're getting closer to it actually happening. So let's talk about it, guys. In an article written by Zach Scharf of IndieWire, Ridley Scott, Gladiator 2 being written now will be ready to go after Napoleon movie. So it was all the way back in November 2018 when Deadline reported that Ridley Scott's Oscar winner Gladiator would be getting a sequel penned by Top Gun Maverick screenwriter Peter Craig. The first story details included the plot centering on Lucius, the son of Connie Nielsen's character Lucillo, uh, Lucilla from the original film. Lucius is the nephew of Joachim Phoenix Commodus, the unsurper uh, Roman emperor killed by Russell Crowe's Maximus. Crowe's character died at the end of the first movie, but the sequel finds Lucius greatly influenced by Maximus. Producers revealed in June of 2019 that Gladiator 2 would take place two decades after the original, which earned over $400 million worldwide and was nominated for 11 Oscars, winning for Best Picture and Best Actor. So, I'm already having the next Gladiator written now, Scott said, so when I've done Napoleon, Gladiator, Gladiator will be ready to go. The Napoleon epic is on Scott's immediate to-do list following the back-to-back -back releases of The Last Duel and House of Gucci this fall. Starring opposite Phoenix is Jodie Comer as Josephine. The Killing Eve Emmy winner earned raves um, out of Venice for her performance in The Last Duel and will reunite with Scott for Kitbag. 
The thing that really makes Napoleon tick is why was he in so much uh, need of Josephine? Scott told Empire about the Napoleon movie. There was a need for each other, and we think we've pinpointed what that was. Production on Gladiator 2 was originally going to happen very quickly, but Scott got busy with the HBO Max television series Raised by Wolves and the features The Last Duel and House of Gucci. The sequel was taken... Uh, shape at Paramount, which brought on screenwriter Craig after he helped work on Tom Cruise's Top Gun Maverick. Craig's other credits include Ben Affleck's Drama The Town, 12 Strong, and the two-part The Hunger Games Mockingjay. So, guys, to say the very least, I am incredibly excited about Gladiator 2. We don't know much yet. I mean, we obviously know a little bit of some of the plot and synopsis of what this story is going to look like, but I am so excited to see a sequel. It really comes down to, not that Ridley Scott has lost his way or anything of that nature. I still think he's one of the greatest directors of all time. But depending on like the source material, we've seen him have a lot of hits and a lot of misses as well when it comes to a sequel. And so I would love to see Gladiator 2 be something really special. Obviously, Russell Crowe would be kind of cool to see uh, a gladiator before the events of the first one and just kind of see more origins and Russell Crowe being in that. But nonetheless, I understand that they got to take this direction after the uh, what happened in the first gladiator and kind of go from there. I'm really excited about it nonetheless, guys. I think a lot of it comes down to obviously who they get as the actors and actresses in this title. That is going to be something really big as well. I'm excited about it. I would love to hear your thoughts. So are you excited about Gladiator 2? What are you hoping to see out of this title? Let me know in the comment section down below. And for more Gladiator 2 content and videos, stay here with Zero TV. The Halloween franchise has brought so many exciting moments for me, guys. Being a massive horror fan, whether it's movies, games... Halloween has been a special one, right? It's not quite to me as iconic as say like for me like the Saw series or something like that, but Halloween is certainly amazing and it spans decades, guys. It's an awesome franchise to say the least and uh, it's definitely up there as far as one of my favorite you know, horror franchises of all time. So how does it end? Well, Halloween Ends, guys, has already been greenlit with Halloween Kills already, you know, being out now, and you can uh, obviously watch the movie, and I really did enjoy Halloween Kills. I thought it was a pretty good uh, title, to say the least, in, in the franchise. I thought it was a good addition. I didn't think it was as good as the previous entry of Halloween, but I still thought it was a great movie overall, like an, uh, another step positively in the right direction. So I want to talk about Halloween Ends, guys, how this franchise ends, and it's going to be something really special. So let's talk about it, guys. I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comment section down below. So let's get into it. So Nicholas Brooks of CBR writes, Halloween Ends promises to end the reinvigorated Slasher franchise, but with the grand finale coming next year, what do we know about the film? So guys, just a warning, the following contains spoilers for Halloween Kills. If you haven't seen it, guys, I would highly recommend checking it out. Um, you've been warned. Halloween Kills sees Michael Myers at his most brutal and unsettling. In one night, he has managed to plunge an entire town into a fear-filled hysteria and even killed Laurie Strode's daughter, Karen. The film sets up a climatic and surprise-filled sequel set to release in October of next year. However, it's hard to decipher the next steps for the final chapter in the series. So... Halloween Ends is not the end. So with a title like Halloween Ends, it's easy to assume that this is the final chapter in a saga that began just over 40 years ago. But rest assured, that is far from the case. In an interview with Slash Film, writer-director David Gordon Green and writer Danny McBride discuss what is next for the franchise. McBride reassures the reason for his eventual return by stating, I feel like Michael Myers is such an iconic horror character. There's a simplicity to why he's scary that I think it will always be relevant for generations to come. Michael may always wear a mask, but he represents a primal fear that has lasted for decades, and McBride perfectly encapsulates why the character will never truly be gone. And I agree. I, I'm excited about that, guys. You know, I'm excited that just because it's Halloween ends doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be the end of the franchise as a whole. That being said, while Michael is here to stay, Green has reaffirmed, reaffirmed that Halloween ends will be his last project, stating rather definitively that it'll be my last one. Nevertheless, his style and impact will likely never leave the character as his vision has helped modernize the slasher for a new generation. Halloween was always going to be a trilogy, guys. Part of why Halloween uh, 2018 was such a hit among moviegoers was because it served as a competent setup for a trilogy. From the moment everyone signed on, McBride explained how they had plans to film the trilogy back-to-back. -back. However, they later tapered 
tapered back their ambitions to deliver a great first outing before focusing on the future of the trilogy. This ultimately proved to be the winning strategy, with Halloween Ends being set up as a colossal finale. So, um, obviously guys, this, this is where it gets really interesting. Halloween Ends features a time jump. So, this trilogy marks the first time there will be a massive time jump mid-narrative. Following the end of Halloween Kills, uh, Michelle has decimated, uh, uh, Michael has decimated a small town and eliminated most of the survivors of the original film. He's also solidified his feud with Laurie Strode by murdering her daughter. And with a time jump, the universe will be better prepared to explore how one person has infected a small town with fear and how the people of Haddonfield have dealt with it. Um, in an interview with Green, he explained that there is a time jump. It gets on, it gets back on, onto a contemporary timeline. So a jump four years. A surprisingly long time off will allow the characters to prepare and focus their grudges against Michael, but the chaos of 2018 in the past, it will also make the story more personal. So, uh, obviously guys, Halloween Ends uh, currently is set to hit theaters October 14th of 2022, and I'm incredibly excited about it because it's going to be the end of this trilogy, but it's not the end of everything. It's not the end of the legacy that is Halloween. Uh, are they going to continue at some point? I, I believe so, guys. Absolutely. Why would they stop doing it when it's so iconic and people are, you know, every, a lot of people talk about it now around Halloween. It's kind of like with Saw. They've tried to kind of bring Saw back and it just hasn't felt the same, whether you're talking about Jigsaw or Spiral. It just hasn't felt the same from those seven films. Halloween's done a really good job of kind of staying relevant throughout all of these decades of Upon decades and it's awesome guys i would love to hear your thoughts on so the comment section down below what did you think about halloween kills and what are you most excited about with halloween ends let me know in the comment section down below and for more halloween ends content and videos stay here with zero tv so Extraction was a title, guys, that I absolutely loved. I thought Chris Hemsworth did a great job in the role. I thought that the movie was a great action film, and when it got greenlit that there was going to be an Extraction 2, I got incredibly excited. So in this segment of the show, guys, I want to talk about Extraction 2, everything that we know so far about this title. I'd love to break it down with you, and then I would love to hear your guys' thoughts about it in the comment section down below. So let's get into it. So guys, in an article written by Ben Pearson of Slash Film, when Extraction debuted in 2020, it broke viewership records for Netflix and became the most watched original movie in the streaming service's history up until that point. A sequel wasn't guaranteed, but after early test screenings, director Sam Hargrave purposefully created an, an ambiguous ending to keep that option on the table should Netflix want to continue the story. After the first film performed so well, um, at least according to Netflix, it's no surprise the streamer decided to make a sequel. At this past weekend's Tundum, to dumb event, Netflix confirmed earlier reports that Extraction 2 is officially in the works. So the sequel will likely receive a small theatrical release in limited cities, but like the first movie, Extraction 2 will primarily be available to watch on Netflix. No, no official release date has been announced yet, but the end of the recent teaser trailer proclaimed that the film would be coming soon. So what will it be about, guys? That's a big question. So the ending of, ending of Extraction, spoilers here, guys. If you haven't seen the movie, go check it out. You've been warned. The ending of Extraction featured ex-military mercenary Tyler Rake getting shot multiple times on a bridge in India after transporting his target, a young boy named Ovi, to safety after taking an absurd amount of damage and having an emotional catharsis as he flashes back to his dead son Rake falls over the edge of the bridge into the water, seemingly to his death. Eight months later, Ovi surfaces in a swimming pool and sees a figure standing at the edge of the pool watching him. Is that myst mystery figure Rake? Is it some other random dude? It's unclear whether Ovi will also play a role in the sequel story. Rake may have just been dropping in to check on him in that pool scene, and it seems narratively cleaner for the merc mercenary to take on a whole new mission with the new lease on life he acquired by saving Ovi. So, what are the things that we know about the cast and crew, guys? We know that Chris Hemsworth will be back to reprise his role as Tyler Rake, but as of now, that's the only guarantee when it comes to Extraction 2. We don't know um, if uh, Ridrashi Jaswal will be back as Ovi or if we'll see any of the earlier days of Rake and Gasper played by Stranger Things actor David Harbour. If the filmmakers do decide to go back in time, I'd love to see more of Saji Rav, the head of Ovi's father's personal security unit, who was also tasked with rescuing the boy in the first movie. He definitely died in that climactic bridge shootout, but actor Randeep Huda brought such a palpable uh, swagger and propulsive quality to that role that it could be fun to explore his character further. 
There's also guys, Joe Russo, who wrote the original, is confirmed to be back as a writer and producer, and Sam Hargrave, who made his feature directorial debut with the first film, seems likely to return behind the camera, but that has not been made official just yet. I would like to be as involved as possible, but I don't. I also don't want to be greedy, Hargrave said last year when asked about directing more movies in the Extraction universe. There's a lot of other super talented filmmakers out there who would have very unique visions and would bring something new and fresh to the franchise that I would be excited to see as a fan. Hopefully, we get to do the second one with all the same team and really establish the franchise, if you will. But from there, I would love to see, as a fan of cinema, other young directors who, again, can push the level of action. So, yes, guys, I am incredibly excited to see Extraction 2. I want to see a return. I, I would actually, you know, prefer guys to, to to certainly see the same, you know, team here. You know, Joe Russo Wright. I'd love to see Sam Hargrave direct. Um, I don't think I would want, if they made a third one, maybe then you can kind of move on from Sam Hargrave. But I think that he should be given, because of how great Extraction 1 was, I think he should be given um, the benefit of the doubt and make a, a, a sequel here. I do think, though, that after 2, he should probably move on to other other ventures if if a director is in that same space for so long a lot of times it can become a problem you kind of get complacent and it just a lot of times doesn't work out in the long run but nonetheless I would love to see him return Chris Hemsworth obviously I would love to see a lot of the original cast and crew return as well this is a title, guys, that I'm very excited about. It's definitely on my most anticipated list of the future, even though we don't have a release date yet. Extraction 2 has everything I think that it needs in order to be a successful title for Netflix. But the question is, guys, what do you think about Extraction 2 being, um, you know, announced here? What do you think is going to be the... What are your thoughts on it? Do you think it's going to be as good as the first one? What direction do you think they should go in? Who do you think should direct it, write it? Let me know in the comment section down below. And for more Extraction 2 content and videos, stay here with Zero TV. And with that being said, everyone, I hope you guys did enjoy this episode of The 8 Below Show. And if you guys did, leave a thumbs up, subscribe if you're new, stay positive, And as always, I'll talk to you guys all in the next one. Peace.